In this video we will cover Newmark's method, which is one of the most popular methods for solving second order differential equations, particularly in the earth earthquake engineering community. Now it's popular partly because it's very accurate, but also because it scales very well to multi-degree of freedom systems, which is something we'll cover in subsequent units. Now Newmark's method makes a fundamental assumption about the behavior of the acceleration between time intervals. And that assumption can come in two variations. One is the constant acceleration assumption, which I'll demonstrate on the left. And one is the linear acceleration assumption, which I'll demonstrate on the right. Now let's demonstrate variation one, constant acceleration first. In this case, I'm going to plot the acceleration trajectory. So at time ti, we have a known acceleration u double dot i. At time ti plus one, we have an unknown acceleration, which we call u double dot i plus one. The assumption the Newmark's method makes here is that in between these two, the acceleration is going to be constant and average. So it's going to lie somewhere between those two points. In the linear acceleration case, the setup is exactly the same. We have an we have a known acceleration at time i, and we have an unknown acceleration at time i plus 1. But in this case, as, as you might guess, the assumed acceleration is linear between the two points. And each of these variations is going to have its advantages and disadvantages, which is the reason why we present both. Now the derivation for the algorithm for both is quite similar we're going to start by defining an equation for the acceleration and then work our way to velocity and displacement. To do so, we're going to define a temporary variable which we'll call tau, and this is going to move from ti to ti plus one. By having a continuous variable here, we just make the differentiation a little bit easier, then we convert to discrete time. So let's start with the derivation for constant average acceleration. We'll start by describing u double dot in terms of tau. And this will look like a simple average of the acceleration at i plus one with the acceleration at i. From here, we integrate twice to get velocity and displacement. Now that we have these two quantities, we can simply plug in delta t for tau to get those quantities at time i plus 1. And so now we have two equations with three unknowns. Everything with the subscript i plus 1. Now let's hop over to the linear acceleration case. In this case, u double dot of tau is going to look a little bit different. It's going to describe a linear change from i to i plus one. So we'll actually have tau and delta t in this equation. But then the process is the same. First, we integrate twice and we get the equations shown here in terms of tau, and then again we plug in tau equal to delta t. Notice again that we have the same quantity of unknowns here. In fact, if you observe closely, you can see that the equation for u dot i plus one is identical in both cases and the equation for displacement is different but has a very similar form. And that's one of the key characteristics of this method. In order to coincide with the Chopra book, we're going to call this first set of equations for velocity equation 5.4.4 and the second set of equations for displacement 5.4.6.
And so these four equations can be standardized into a set of two general equations by replacing some of the constants with either a constant beta or a constant gamma. And depending on whether we are using the average constant acceleration approach or the linear acceleration approach, these constants will change, but the equations will remain the same. And this is a huge convenience that the numerics method allows because we can quickly switch between two methods simply by switching these coefficients. In the case of average acceleration, which is the constant acceleration method, we would plug in beta equal to 1 fourth and gamma equal to 1 half. And in the case of the linear acceleration assumption, we would plug in beta equal to 1 sixth and gamma equal to 1 half. So I encourage you to go back to the original set of equations and see how this generalization actually works using these constants. And so the procedure from here on out is going to look very similar to the central difference method. We're going to start from the equation of motion again and plug our values of acceleration, velocity, and displacement in. So plugging in those general equations 5.44 and 5.46, we get the complex equation that you see here. And in order to make things easier, we're going to try to simplify this and rearrange it. So the final form we really want is something like the following. k hat times some unknown ui plus 1 equal to a p hat at time i plus 1. And this p hat can also be written as our force at time i plus 1 plus some value a1 times ui, which is known, some value a2 times u dot i, which is also known, and some value a3 times u double dot i, which is also known. And so the final algorithm makes all of that explicit. So you here you have initial calculations, which calculate your initial acceleration. Then the values for each of these coefficients, a1 through a3. Again, notice that these are in terms of beta, gamma, delta t, and our system parameters, m, c, and k. So these are actually constant values. And then we also calculate our k hat. From then on, we step through each time instance and calculate our p hat and use that to solve for the displacement at the following time step. And finally, we can use the generalized equations to solve for velocity and acceleration at the next time step as well. Now this version of Newmark's algorithm is referred to as the explicit method because we use the equation of motion to solve explicitly for ui plus 1. However, this only works if that equation of motion is that of a linear system, which is what we used previously. In the case of nonlinear systems, we must switch to what is called the implicit method. In this method, we cannot use the equation of motion directly as a third equation. Instead, we must first guess the value of the acceleration at time i plus 1, then use that equation of motion to check the difference between the force pi and the dynamic forces. And by dynamic forces, I mean the elastic force, the damping force, and the inertial force. The difference between those two is what we will call the residual force. Once you've obtained the residual force, you must iterate on that value of the acceleration to try to get that below a certain tolerance level. So once the residual force is close enough to zero, you have a convergent solution and you can move on to the next step. I recommend you guys check Chopra section 5.7 to see this algorithm. The reason for bringing up this explanation is to illustrate that in the reason for bringing up this explanation is to illustrate that even though the Newmark's method can be used to solve nonlinear equations of motion, it does require this type of iteration at each time step, which does incur 
an additional computational cost. As we will see in the following section, the Runge-Kutta method actually can solve nonlinear equations motions explicitly, which makes it much more computationally efficient.